hydrogen from seawater, quite an interesting and innovative topic uh, given the current um, net zero uh, ambitions for UK. I'll uh, introduce Carl. Carl is an economist who has previous, previously founded, uh, grew and exited two Finnish companies. He created the first public private impact investment project for the Philadelphia Water, Water Department. Uh, whilst working for ED, EDNF Man in London, Carl came in touch with the sh uh, shipping industry and learned uh, about the contribution to global pollution and its related, uh, related challenges regarding upcoming um, uh, water treatment plant and emissions regulations. Um, please uh, welcome Carl to the um, uh, webinar. Uh, um, please ensure that your question and answers come through the chat session. Uh, and if you're not presenting, I request you to please kindly switch off your video so we can focus our attention on Carl and the knowledge he has to bring to us. So welcome aboard once again, everyone. Uh, the presentation will last 35, 40 minutes. In the end, we will go through your Q and A. Uh, I'm co-joined co by my colleague Adishna, who will uh, help us take the questions in the end. So once again, uh, welcome everyone and that show is all yours, Carl. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I hope you can all hear me and I am, uh, I may not need 35 minutes, so we may have more time for questions and uh, very few answers, of course. Um, let me start with a short high level overview or video about uh, what it is that we are aiming to do and then I will continue with a um, presentation. But the, uh, the video is usually something that uh, helps uh, everybody to, to get on the same page. Over the past few decades, we have learned how to produce energy from waves, wind, and the sun. Sometimes these renewable energy sources produce more electricity than we can use. Instead of letting it go to waste, it is better to store this energy. The best solution is to store the surplus energy in hydrogen, so it can easily be reused. To convert the electricity, we use an electrolyzer to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Current technology requires pure water for this process. We have developed revolutionary technology that can use seawater or brine from desalination to produce green hydrogen. The hydrogen can be used to stabilize the grid or as emission-free fuel for ships or planes. Our technology also delivers some additional valuable byproducts that offset the cost of the hydrogen production. It can also be used to capture CO2 from exhaust or from seawater. The Ship Electrolyzer. Revolutionary, affordable, green. Okay, that was it. Of course not. Um, the, uh, is there a question in the chat? Oh, okay. So let me quickly go through a, uh, a presentation to go into more detail and so that you can have your questions for later on. SHIP, we were founded officially as a company in April 2019 uh, whilst going through the Port XL Accelerator program in Rotterdam. My co-founder and I, we met a year before that. My co-founder who developed the technology at Columbia University in New York. Um, and I came across it reading an article in, uh, in a scientific journal. And at the time, because of my little understanding of the maritime sector, I thought that this could be the stone that kills two birds, i.e. ballast water treatment for the shipping industry, but also offering emission-free fuel. 
So I approached Colombia, suggested uh, that perhaps it would be a good idea to for a startup coming out based on that technology. And uh, we ended up in a meeting in May 2018 with the tech transfer people of Colombia at the time. Nobody in the US was interested in hydrogen. And um, so when we when I entered the room, literally the first question I was asked was, what are you going to do with this? Um, they literally had no idea what the technology could be doing for uh, the maritime sector. Um, we went then through a program called PowerBridge, which is sponsored by the New York uh, State Research and Development Agency, NYSERDA, that helps startups coming out of New York universities to gain traction. Um, we were lucky, we were awarded a validation grant at the time and uh, could therefore develop the technology to a level around TRL 4 to 5. And that's also where we entered Port XL. And we entered Port XL initially based on the idea of the ballast water treatment only. And uh, the shipping industry looked at it and said, basically, yes, ballast water treatment is a nice to have, but you can produce hydrogen. That's much more interesting. And that's really where, when we started to focus more on the hydrogen production of things, and then we entered decarbonizing shipping, a, a Singapore-based program where we more or less met with the same um, group of, of interested companies that we met in Rotterdam. We then became uh, finalists in the Repsol Foundation Award, where it was the first time that we were in touch with oil and gas. Um, we're then included in what you see on the back of my screen, Port XL, um, at, at Tech X uh, of, of the Oil and Gas Technology Center in Aberdeen, uh, where we had a lot more exposure to the oil and gas industry. And at the moment, uh, I'm here online out of Copenhagen, uh, where we are part of an accelerator program called Green, Green Up, which is sponsored by the Danish Technology University, um, looking at startups that mitigate climate change. So we see that problems create opportunities and we see the two main problems for anything around seawater is a, the maritime sector, of course, uh, shipping in particular, trying to reduce emissions either from hydrogen as an emission-free fuel or a derivative, say, ammonia made from green hydrogen or methanol made from green hydrogen. And of course, the offshore wind industry that creates a lot of surplus energy that at the moment, um, as the video mentioned briefly, either goes to waste or is being given away for free, or even sometimes the industry has to pay for it to be taken. Uh, that, of course, is not a sustainable business model for offshore wind. So what they rather would do is store that surplus energy in hydrogen and then sell it when they get a price for it. The maritime sector is confronted with the, with the threat of uh, uh, a, a, an emission tax. Um, Maersk here in Denmark uh, literally last week suggested that this emission, uh, this emission tax should be $450 per ton. Um, just to give you an idea, one ton of bunker fuel, which the maritime industry uses most of the time, creates three tons of CO2. So um, currently a ton of bunker fuel is $400 roughly. And so you can imagine what the, the price change would be if there was an emission tax of that of that size on it, um, and of course the the uh, maritime sector is is now become increasingly interested in emission free fuel solutions. So why is that not possible with existing technology, which is displayed here? You have uh, the use of seawater. Uh, what you have here is the typical PEM on the right hand side, or the alkaline electrolyzer on the left hand side. They are the existing technology to electrolyze water to produce hydrogen and ox oxygen from water by splitting. Uh, both of them use something like a membrane or in the case of the alkaline electrolyzer, it's called a diaphragm. And they cannot 
withstand seawater. Seawater is highly corrosive, is very aggressive. Um, so the membranes break or the diaphragm breaks. And these are the two most expensive parts of the electrolyzer. So what the industry is trying to do at the moment is to desalinate and purify the seawater before it's being used to store, produce hydrogen, say, at an offshore wind turbine. And the challenge they're facing here is that the desalination units and the purification units permanently break down, create maintenance headaches, uh, so much so that um, we've learned of cases where they now start to ship fresh water from onshore to the wind turbine in order to produce hydrogen. Again, something that is certainly not sustainable longer term. Our electrolyzer is a membrane-free electrolyzer, which means in our case that we can use seawater, we can use it as is with in ambient temperature, so we don't even have to heat it up. Um, and because of that, um, we can also, because we can use seawater, we can also produce a number of byproducts because there's a lot of, there are a lot of elements in seawater that are actually quite useful. So what we do, and what you see here in the picture is on the left is the first step. We separate seawater in acid and base, which allows us to do these additional, um, by, create these additional byproducts or services. And then we use just a little bit of the alkaline portion of that seawater and add it to the seawater that goes into the hydrogen production. And what that does is it increases the pH value of the seawater for the electrolysis. And in doing so, we avoid chlorine evolution and biofouling of the electrodes in the hydrogen production. What it also does, of course, is it creates additional revenues for us because the byproducts that we can produce from seawater here are, for instance, magnesium hydroxide or silica, or we can capture CO2 from seawater. Now, capturing CO2 from seawater is way more efficient than from air because in seawater, CO2 is about 120 times as dense as in air. So we have an opportunity to um, capture it at a, at a much better price. And that, again, makes it attractive for oil and gas because the combination of the CO2 that we capture plus the hydrogen that we produce, and then you have all the necessary components to produce synthetic fuel. That is really what the, uh, the companies during our period at the OGTC Accelerator TechX were very interested in. As you can see on the left, the ballast water treatment is still an option and it's actually an attractive option in some markets. Um, just to give you an example, in, uh, in California, it is almost impossible to produce hydrogen at a reasonable price. Why is that? Because existing technology has energy as its biggest cost factor and energy prices in California are unregulated and extremely high. That means the price of hydrogen is high. In California, you pay any, anywhere between eight to $16 per kilogram of hydrogen. So that's not attractive to any user, let alone the sh shipping industry. So uh, we were approached by um, some, some companies that regularly shuttle between China mainland and California. And uh, they were very interested in using hydrogen for auxiliary engines when they are birth at birth in port um, because they're not allowed to run them anymore because of pollution, but they could with hydrogen, but they can't get it. So um, we suggested that if we were allowed or if we were offered to also treat their ballast water when they're in port and charge them the usual rate that they would have to pay anyway, then we could offer hydrogen at a competitive price because the income from the, the revenue from the ballast water treatment would have set that uh, additional cost. So just to give you an idea of what these additional revenue streams mean for us. And that allows us to offer that price for hydrogen, which of course is something that 
everybody who sees it in the industry is um, immediately sitting up, uh, likes to see that, because it's the biggest obstacle to the hydrogen economy, the price. Uh, even in Europe, or uh, where you can get it relatively or comparatively cheap uh, compared to the US, it's still around about three to six euros per kilogram. And if you translate that into a price for shipping, you need about 260 or 250 kilogram of hydrogen to replace one ton of bunker fuel. You can easily realize that uh, even at the lower end, they would have to pay around about 750 euros per ton where they can buy it uh, as a bunker fuel for $400 a ton. So there's still a big gap, but if you can get it for free, then of course that changes the uh, equation quite significantly even if we were to ask for 50 cents for it, for example. That also means the, the revenue from the byproducts that the payback period for an electrolyzer with our system is significantly shorter than that of a competition uh, because we not just sell hydrogen, we sell uh, several byproducts as well. And um, if you then look at the way we want to build it. We want to build it modularly, i.e. our pilot will be a washing machine size version of an electrolyzer. And if it works as expected, we want to modularly stack those machines into a shipping container. And then we end up with a two megawatt electrolyzer very quickly. Then of course you can stack shipping containers on top of each other. All of what you just heard about the revenues and the modularity and the seawater of course in particular created a lot of interest for us from a number of ports in particular, um, ports in the North Sea like Rotterdam, Antwerp, Aberdeen Harbour, but also from ports in other places like Soha in Oman or Abu Dhabi or Gladstone in Australia. The reason there is that we can use brine from desalination. And if you're familiar with brine, brine is what you get when you desalinate water. One liter of drinking water from desalinated water creates about one and a half liters of brine. Brine is a, a very salty sludge um, toxic, um, you can't do anything with it so far. And we can use it just as we were to use seawater. Actually, we um, our, our uh, revenue stream is slightly better because um, the, we create more of the byproducts like magnesium or silica, but also we get paid to take it because it's a waste product in, in the countries that have uh, the problem. So we have a lot of interest from those countries and from those ports, but we also have interest from offshore wind, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and also related industries. For instance, companies like uh, floating platform service operators who were shuttling between oil platforms and onshore, uh, they are interested because they see it as a potential to change their business model away from oil and gas to, to transport hydrogen or even the byproducts that we produce and um, they see their advantage in the fact that they not like a pipeline uh, tied to a fixed endpoint somewhere, they can go wherever it's needed. So they, they see that as an, as an opportunity here. Um, then of course, the, the Ørstads of this, of this world are very interested in what we're trying to do. And then also the, the maritime sector uh, at the moment, for instance, there is a company in Belgium, a big ship operator that has created a joint venture with a local machine manufacturer to produce a um, combustion engine that runs on hydrogen. And they already uh, um, demonstrated their first prototype of a one megawatt unit uh, they see as their first market the the possibility to use them for auxiliary purposes auxiliary engines in port but if they work as expected they don't see why they can't increase it in size to become full powered engines for vessels um, the fuel cell 
is a long way away from powering ocean-going vessels. Uh, we're talking about engines the size of 40, 60, 90 megawatts. So that's something that the fuel cell would probably not be able to do for a while. Um, the other problem that they see with fuel cells is that um, they may not have the skill set on boards of vessel to fix a broken fuel cell uh, if it happens. And of course, there is no road assistance out there on the sea. So they're used to uh, being able to repair a diesel engine. And the, uh, the engines that they're building at the moment are very similar to diesel engines, only that they run on hydrogen. Um, we are working towards our pilot. We were supposed to pilot in the last quarter of last year in Rotterdam. Uh, COVID-19 had other plans for us. Uh, we had to close down our lab. We couldn't finish our pilot in time. And <clears throat> Rotterdam would not have been able to uh, accommodate us anyway. So now we are aiming to pilot in the uh, fourth quarter of this year in Scotland, uh, around COP26, hopefully. Um, possibly in, the, in Aberdeen Harbour, they're very keen to have us. Um, the, um, the pilot, as I mentioned before, the size is about a washing machine. The pilot will be supported by OGTC and uh, Repsol because we were finalists there. And the, the stack will most likely be provided by Williamson. Williamson is a or was perhaps the biggest ship operator globally. They have a 3D printing arm. They approached us to become our OEM and uh, distributor <clears throat> and provided us with a sample, which was really high quality and uh, very competitively priced. So, <coughs> excuse me. So we're hoping that, uh, that this will go according to plan for a change and we can pilot in uh, Aberdeen at the end of this year. So now you know a little bit more about the, um, the technology. Um, Very good. Thank you very much, Cal, for introducing us to the topic. Uh, it was a pleasure listening to you listen, and listening to the videos as well. Uh, there's been a few questions popping in, probably start off with from Parag's questions. Uh, and Parag's is uh, wanting to know, was the TRL technology ready to this level for this technology? Would you like to elaborate a bit more? In the meantime, while Carl's answering the question, I will request, urge uh, the, our participants to just please send through any more questions that they have. Over to you, Carl. So we're currently TRL four to five. Um, this is due to COVID. Uh, we are supposed to be TRL six to go into the pilot. Uh, we think we can get there in time for the end of this year. So uh, that's in a nutshell where we are. Okay, thank you, Carl. A question has been asked. Can you get access to this presentation? Yes, the presentation has been recorded. We'll make sure that the access is provided. Um, and, and just a question for myself. Do you have any patents for this technology at the moment? Is there anything that is in the pipeline so that uh, you don't have uh, your hard work being distributed by others in the industry? Would you like to comment on that? Absolutely. So yes, we have a, a bunch of pilots, uh, sorry, patents. Um, we have patents on the item, on the stack itself, but also on the process of the, uh, of the way we, we produce our um, byproducts and the, and the hydrogen. So we, we are pretty well protected here and the patents are international. Okay, no, cool. Another question just come through is uh, how efficient is it? Um, a kilowatt of electricity versus a kg of hydrogen is something that we were discussing before this webinar started. So maybe want to provide some uh, thoughts on that as well, Carl? Absolutely. That's a frequently asked question. So our efficiency is in terms of the hydrogen production is similar to that of an alkali electrolyzer. So we need approximately just under 60 kilowatt hours per one kilogram of hydrogen. Um, and that's for the full system. So including producing the byproducts. If we don't produce the byproducts, for instance, if we were to put our ex um, electrolyzer onto a, an offshore wind platform, the byproducts may not be so attractive because there's not much space to store them. Um, we can then increase the efficiency quite a bit, not to a level of a PEM, but uh, a lot higher than we are at uh, right now. So we would probably need 
53 kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen. Okay, okay, Doug. And uh, just to further continue the question that was just asked, um, what sort of um, electrical power or, or do you expect in the prototypes you got coming up with, especially with Aberdeen Harbour, et cetera? So would you like to provide some thoughts? Yeah, I mean, we, we're obviously aiming to get uh, um, renewable energy, either from solar or from wind or from wave. Um, uh, Aberdeen Harbour indicated that they could connect us to uh, renewable energy. Uh, in, Rotterdam, in Rotterdam, we were definitely uh, we would have definitely been connected to renewable energy. So that's that's what we're looking for to get uh, offshore wind energy or something like that. Thank you. Doug. Uh, and then the question just come in from Praveen is asking, what type of catalyst uh, do you use for for this um, uh, separation system that you've got? Um, well, we we basically have just the seawater. And then um, it, the, the, uh, the, the splitting happens at the electrodes. Uh, the electrodes we use are just pretty much nickel iron alloys. Um, they are only coated in a particular way on one side, which then enables the oxygen evolution on one and the hydrogen evolution on the other one. Okay, uh, we touched on this before the um, presentation as well about uh, expansion, and you mentioned uh, "sky is the limit." I, still, I remember that quote. <laughs> uh, well, somebody's one of our participants is asking us, "What plans do you have in scaling up the technology? Would you would like to give some uh, view of your future next five-year plan for the organization?" Absolutely. Um, so, uh, if everything goes according to plan, which it never does, but there's always hope, um, we stack these uh, modular washing machines into a shipping container, a standard shipping container, which would give us a two megawatt unit. And then you could stack these shipping containers on top of each other. Uh, in terms of expansion, we have, uh, apart from the interest that we mentioned from the ports in, in Europe and in, in overseas, um, we have a lot of interests from a company called Vopak. Vopak is a, an independent terminal provider, if you like, it's the, the gas station for vessels. And um, they are in 60 ports globally, and they are so interested in what we're trying to do that they said they would like to offer us their footprint globally to expand. So this is the idea to use the 60 ports that they have uh, going forward over the next, next five years or so to expand. Okay. And if we, if we can manage to get five megawatt uh, units in each of those ports, I think we have our hands full. Very good. Uh, future's looking right. Uh, another question that's coming from Femi is uh, on purity. Um, purity might affect the uh, eventual utilization. Will this be tested against ISO 14687 to check its possible utilization in FCEVs, et cetera? So yeah, we, we, know, we know, of course, the, about the fuel cell uh, uh, purity that we need. So at the moment, we've managed to get a purity of about 99.8%. Um, that's maybe not quite good enough, but of course we can install the purifier behind that uh, as, as, a, as, a, as the end product. That's actually something that's being done with alkaline electrolyzers quite a bit, so it's, it's not uncommon and it's not particularly expensive. Okay, uh, just to pause from technical into economical question, economics questions. I know you like economics, economic related Q and A. Um, you've mentioned about a lot of funding grants, etc. The organisations received. Uh, do you have? Does any subsidiaries for from uh, local councils or, or or different countries that you operate and from the governments, etc. For for prototype projects, uh, and have you been successful in in, in accessing those so far? Yes, I mean, we've, <clears throat> so far we've survived on grants, literally. Um, we've had uh, about $150,000 in the US, we had about 75,000 euros in Rotterdam, and we now have 200,000 pounds in the UK. Um, that's, that's about the, the overall amount that we've received in grants. We are currently uh, fundraising. We are in a very advanced stage with a major energy company that is interested in investing in in uh, ship. Um, if we get that kind of investment that uh, they mentioned as a seven figure number, then we are well on, on our way. Thank you, Doug. A few more questions have come in uh, since we will continue to talk. Um, without membranes, how pure the products will be? It's, um, I think it's a very valid question. Uh, any, any ideas on that? 
Yeah, it's it's uh, the, the the purity is as mentioned before in terms of hydrogen about ninety nine point eight at the moment, and we we think we can improve that, but also with a with a purifier in the end improve that. Uh, the the byproducts is no problem at all. We have already had um, a number of potential buyers look at uh, samples, and they were all very happy with that. Um, the magnesium, for instance, is is about ninety four percent purity, which is uh, good enough even for pharma industry. Um, so we, we, we are very happy with that. Okay. Uh, and one of our other participants is asking, what issues do you anticipate when you're trying to scale up? Uh, you mentioned about two megawatt prototypes uh, and scaling up into 20 megawatts, et cetera, or, uh, large units. What issues do you anticipate uh, in, in that scaling up process? So as long as we stay on the, on the road with modularity, uh, we don't see that many uh, question marks from the technology point of view. Um, we have, of course, of course, been asked many times whether we could build it simply bigger than modular, um, and we don't know that yet. We are confident that we can increase it to some extent. Um, will we be able to build one megawatt unit as one stack, so to speak? Uh, we don't know that, and we haven't really focused on it yet because we want to get the pilot off the ground. But uh, simply with the with the modular approach, we can easily easily scale without having any major uh, technology problems where we will have problems and that might be of interest to some or many of you is um, and we've had that before we have difficulties identifying and retaining talent we need really dedicated and excellent electrochemists and if we can find those um, we have no problem at all uh, we have lost two CTOs on our way so far uh, not because they didn't like what they were doing, but they did like the salaries that the competition can offer better than what we can offer. We are a startup. Uh, so we have uh, limited um, uh, funding opportunities. So uh, if you know the, 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 the well-equipped competition like Siemens or just any other, pick any other name <clears throat> is out there offering six-figure salaries uh, for somebody starting, that's not something we can match, and that's our that's our biggest challenge, literally. Okay, uh, it's good to know that you face similar challenges as other other startups in the, in this arena. Uh, another another technical question has come up is how easy is it to retrofit existing ships with the system? Uh, existing ships, I would say, it is a very small, a very slim chance to retrofit them. Um, you, if you can retrofit the engine to run on hydrogen, which is possible, uh, then that's one hurdle. The other hurdle is where and how do you store the hydrogen on a vessel? Uh, while we can produce some hydrogen uh, during basically while sailing, um, it's, it won't be enough to, to run an entire vessel on it. So there is the storage question. That's literally the, the biggest obstacle at the moment. And that's also why the industry is looking for something like methanol or ammonia, because it appears to be easier to store on a vessel. Um, what you can do, of course, is you can run your auxiliary engines in port, and they can easily be either retrofitted or uh, you can just replace them. OK. Uh, another one's come in is um, you spoke about a combustion plant that runs on hydrogen. Can you tell us a bit more about that, if, if possible, Carl? Yeah. So uh, CMB, the company that I mentioned, in, in, based in Belgium, they've run a, a small ferry in the port for a while on a modified uh, Volvo diesel. And they could literally switch between diesel and hydrogen after the modification. Um, it, the modification was actually developed and implemented by a UK-based engineering company. And uh, CMB was so impressed by it that they bought the company and now integrate that technology and that idea into much larger engines. And they've teamed up with a ma machine manufacturer in Belgium to build the larger versions. But the, uh, the technical development behind it is still based on the same concept that the English engineering company uh, introduced. Okay, Doug. Uh, I, there's no more questions, but I think we can tell from the level of uh, engagement we've had, uh, your presentation was very valued and very 
uh, very well understood by our participants. You'll be pleased to know we had uh, 20 plus uh, participants joining us uh, and the level of engagement shows it was a very, very good presentation. So Thank thanks you. once again, Carl, for taking up your time to deliver a presentation and a video to us. Uh, so on the behalf of AFB Scotland, thank you once again. Uh, so to other participants that have joined us, I'll tell you a little bit about AFB, Association for Black and Ethnic Min Minority Engineers. Uh, it's not an association only for ethnic engineers, it's open for uh, uh, any other uh, engineer or not even engineers, any other individuals within the industry uh, that uh, is keen to ed educate and learn about more and, and support others. There's, we organize events for uh, our, a number of events on a monthly basis. This is a real projects team. Uh, we've got a number of other events coming through. On Saturday 26th of uh, June, we've got a presentation of a day in life of an RF engineer, which should be quite interesting to um, to join. Uh, there's on next week on Wednesday, we've got a chief net zero, which aligns with Carl's presentation, uh, achieving net zero and how we can play our part, which is, should be quite interesting for all of us to hear. Uh, on 5th of July, we've got the IET Young Woman of the Engineer Awards. And one of the most anticipated uh, programs of the year is on 21st of October, the AFBE Awards and the Gala. I'm sure you all have purchased your tickets. If you haven't, uh, time's, uh, time's running out. So please, please proceed uh, with uh, purchasing your tickets. Um, I, we, I'm, I'm sure you can see from the comments, uh, Carl, that everyone really enjoyed your presentation. So uh, thanks once again for taking the time out. And thanks once again to all the participants for coming in and joining and listening to Carl. Uh, thanks and have a great evening.